Today, uh, we've got a few things we want to share with you um, about the role of research and development at Element Architects, uh, Element Architects here in Seattle, or there in Seattle. We, um, we've been a firm, uh, the firm's been around for about 30 years. Uh, we, we dress like this every day. Um, but uh, it's, it's a really perfect size for a firm. We're about 140 people. It allows us to do a lot of different things, projects of large scales, but also we're small enough to be nimble and try some new experiments uh, that, that we can execute in some really exciting ways. About six years ago, we formed this group called Tech Studio. Um, I was uh, part of the, the advancement of that, and Scott was one of our very first uh, founding members. Um, and so that group really was focused towards various modes of exploration uh, in re research and development in, um, in the field of, uh, of architecture, obviously. Um, and, and to us, really sort of most importantly, the question that keeps recurring over the years for us is how, how can we use the, the, the results and the progress of research and apply it to what essentially is public work. We do a lot of public work in this, in this office. Um, and, and that public work is, is really unique in many ways. Um, and I'll review a few of the things that, that, that sort of have triggered a lot of these responses. You know, we're, we're constantly dealing with a variety of fee structures, which sometimes our fees are really stipulated by owners. They have to understand our profit model. Uh, we have often, we're often dealing with very prescribed delivery methods of projects. Uh, we have multi-headed clients with a real variety of expertise that they have. Um, and as architects, we play many roles. So we need to be very nimble and versatile in that process. Um, so we sometimes are the prime architect, or sometimes hold the prime contract as a consultant in these jobs. Sometimes we're a sub-consultant. Uh, we certainly direct the public process, which is a really important part uh, of, of what we do in public projects. Uh, we're the public face, really, of the, of the ideas of, that, the, uh, that the public agency is trying to push forward. Um, we establish the design uh, and collaboration projects, uh, pr process for these projects. Um, and ultimately, we find that we're really the instigator of new, new ideas and new approaches. So with that, the, there's an idea today that we want to talk about this convergence of research and development and the project work into what we apply really as applied research here. And so we want to give you a little brief history of, of how that's evolved over the last six years, uh, looking at three different projects. Uh, sort of the infancy of the group was back in 2010 uh, on a project we built in Cleveland, a new project which is under construction right now at the University of Iowa, and one right now that's in the planning, uh, early planning stages um, in, in Seattle, which is a bridge. The interesting thing about these is they really run the gamut of, of, of our involvement in these projects. We were originally focused very specifically on a facade system. Uh, we then, in the next project, in the next project, excuse me, uh, we're looking a lot at multiple systems within a building, um, and now really trying to carry this forward in a project and, and think about the role that research can play throughout the entirety of a project. Um, they have also represent a real diversity in project approaches, design build, hard bid, and even at this point we're, we're really unsure about the future of, a, of the delivery method, but we are certainly directing it in this, in this last example. So uh, back in Cleveland around 2010, we had this incredible opportunity to design a very large building. It was a, a showroom facility for medical, the medical industry adjacent to a convention center. And we had some ideas back then about how we could link up our analytic tools and our generative tools to really drive design, drive an aesthetic that was really critical to the project, but also come up with a solution which was incredibly affordable. We had a very low budget, and we had about three, mo three months to design and deliver this uh, for the entirety of the project. So back then, the challenge then was how do you marry this generative tool, which is still in its infancy, to this collaborative tool, which everybody was involved in. So we developed a plug-in. This is obviously ancient history, but it was really important for us because it was a moment where we realized that there was a real power in applying research and development in, uh, in technology directly to projects, allowing the generative model to be directly linked. We were able to solve a lot of the particular problems related to fabrication, um, really driving essentially fabrication documents. This was a design-build project, so it was incredibly flexible in that regard. There was a lot of trust in the team. We did a lot of research into how concrete itself could be cast, or what, the, what the tolerances could be in that system and how that might work. And ultimately, in-house fabrication led to the design studies themselves that, that pushed forward and became the ultimate building. And at scale, it's really exciting to see these ideas go from 
really a, a very nimble, small grasshopper model to the real project. And ultimately, we were able to deliver this uh, for about $65 a square foot of a facade system, which uh, was pretty incredible at the time, considering our three months design delivery schedule for this. More recently, a project we've been working on uh, in Iowa. This is a new school of music for the University of Iowa. The interesting thing about this, there are a lot of interesting things about this project, but one of the most interesting is that um, we are funded by FEMA, uh, which means, I don't know if any of you out there have actually done work for FEMA, but it's an incredibly rigorous process for procurement of the work. Um, and for, for bidding of the, of the work. So it's very difficult to carry forward those ideas of trust uh, with the design and construction team forward into the uh, construction of the building. So we really had to look for new inventive ways of applying the research that we were doing into design and design technology and documentation forward into this project. And Scott's gonna talk a little bit about how we did that in this project. So while we were working on the Cleveland facade system, the challenge there was really about how do we use inter or get the interoperability that we needed to go from the Grasshopper model to then the Revit model with documentation. We now had that behind us when we moved into Iowa, so it was no longer focusing on how do we just get our tools to work, but what are we going to now do with these tools? And so looking at even more systems within the building, given that it's a school of music, there was a lot of acoustic systems that we were working on. So we were taking and actually building tools that helped us better visualize what was going to be happening when it came to uh, the acoustics, so a simple ray tracing tool. Using this as actually a discussion point with our consultant or acoustic consultant to better understand what their aims were for the project. They would give us parameters of saying the system should match these dimensions and we could build something to that, but it wasn't necessarily telling us whether it was better or worse than anything else. So whenever we're taking and doing these studies, we're also looking at it from a point of view of how we're, are we going to make these things. Uh, it's not necessarily going to be the way that someone else is going to make it in the end, but it's getting us thinking about what is the formwork for this thing as a cast object going to look like? What does it mean if we make one of them? What if we take and actually make the entire wall as this whole panelized system? And as we have all of these panels and of different types, we're needing to take and make sure the documentation is going to convey that. Because one of the things we really learned with Cleveland was it's not so much about limiting that number of unique pieces you have and making sure that you're optimizing it to make it the most simple thing possible, but instead being extremely clear in your documentation of these things so that the information that we're turning over to the fabricators to actually build this, they can go directly forward with. And that was really important when it came to this other acoustic system within this project, uh, the ceiling reflector. There's over 900 different panels when we were taking and going through this, we were actually taking and prototyping the panels out of the actual material that we were interested in using. There was a lot of skepticism at first about the use of this material. It's Al Pollock or aluminum composite panel, typically used for facades. It had the density that we needed, but our acoustic consultant was concerned it wasn't going to work. So we built a mock-up and we put it in front of them and they could then take and do tests on these materials and look at it and say, actually, this is probably going to be just fine. It also served the benefit of us making this mock-up in a weekend and then being able to show up and share that with uh, fabricators. Their mock-up ends up looking very similar to ours. Ours was a third of the size that theirs was, but there's a confidence that we have taken and developed the design to a point where it is actually buildable and not some crazy thing we dreamed up and threw into a rendering. And, and throughout that process, there's an inevitability of the fact that a project like this needs to be hard bid. So what we're doing is we're assembling a traditional drawing set and we're throwing it over the fence and crossing our fingers that someone can build this. So at the end of the day, it's really important that we can deliver documents that really convey a sense of mastery of the digital information. Um, we've done this on projects previous to this where without supplying enough information, in fact, we had bidders win the job because they thought they could essentially pull it off with a jigsaw. Um, so a lot of this is, is really, it's incumbent upon us as, as designers and technologists to, to really use the data, embed the, the data in the drawings, uh, not so much that it, act, that it actually use it. This is an example of one of our uh, sheets in the drawing set. We had a, several sheets like this, which essentially listed all of the data for every single piece that needed to be made. The idea wasn't that these guys would actually copy this and put it into their model and make the pieces, but essentially that they knew that there was somebody on the other end of the, of the project when they won the, won the award that ultimately 
uh, there were people there that mastered, they really mastered the data and they could actually fabricate directly from a model. And that's sort of where we are right now. They're, they have the digital models that we've built and they are fabricating directly from them despite this really traditional design bid build uh, construct that we had in that project. So this last project is closer to home for us in Seattle. We're working on a pedestrian bridge that'll cross over uh, the main interstate, I-5, that runs north-south through the city. Uh, that took and cut off uh, several neighborhoods when it was first constructed, so this is an attempt to try to restitch those back together. By the time you get on the bridge, right here, to the point where you come all the way over to here, you've traveled about 2,060 feet in the air on top of the, the, the surface. So you can either do this as a pedestrian or as a bike, and that's the reason for all the ramp. Initially, there was a thought that there would be an elevator on each of those ends, but you could imagine if you're using this with a bike, there's probably going to be a backup of all these people uh, trying to get into uh, that elevator. So in order to convince the city that we thought we could actually pull this off with all the ramping, they needed to know how this was going to work out. So from the very beginning of this project, we decided we were going to do everything as its own parametric model. We were going to share this model with all of the consultants. We are not the prime contract holder on this, but yet we're driving all the geometry to the rest of our consultants. So there's a process that initially starts out by taking and looking at how we can take and find the alignment on the site. So using the survey data that we had, projecting a potential alignment of the bridge onto that, finding out where the high points are because we have certain clearances we have to maintain over the highway, and building up this workflow that would essentially calculate the ramps every time we shifted it. And we would use this tool in meetings with the client to answer any questions they might have of, well, what happens if we actually move it more to the north and we spiral down in the opposite direction? And so we were able to take and show them not only what that ramp looked like, but takeoffs related to the height above ground that uh, the bridge was. And these became really helpful for us to figure out what the shortest and best alignment was going to be, but also from a costing point of view, we could actually use the heights above the ground to inform the structural costs. So the overall project uh, ends up being broken down um, after we establish that alignment into the different spans. So the green areas are cast in place girders, so that's these sections, and then the blue area would be this tube truss. So within those two structural systems, uh, we're taking and exploring how we can have this parametric model essentially define every single one of those spans, even though each of them are different in both their length as well as uh, curvature. An idea that we came upon very early on with some of the research that we were doing and looking into other things was the potential for actually making all the connections within our tube truss as cast steel nodes. So when we started looking at that potential, we start taking, and again, making things. We're taking and using a CNC router to just carve blocks of wood to say what would these nodes potentially look like. And then zooming in on these spans, it's actually taking then and breaking the wireframe down in such a way that those green areas represent the wireframe of the nodes that would be then used to drive the actual production and analysis of the cast nodes. And then the blue areas are all straight segments of tube. And we can provide this wireframe to our structural engineer to then run the analysis to tell us what the forces are going through the tube. And then from that, the analysis can take place on the actual nodes from a different consultant. So here's all those tubes, the nodes. And now over the thousand plus feet of length of this tube truss that we have, we actually only have about five different nodes that we're creating. Uh, so there's a real efficiency here. It's Kind of going back to saying before, we're not necessarily trying to create just this small kit of parts, but in this case, there's a value to that kit of parts because the production and all the tooling that would go into making these, we can actually find great efficiencies um, by being able to take and limit the number of unique pieces. Now, even still within that small number of unique pieces, there's going to be the need for variation. So at this particular node, if we look at it, you might have two 16-inch uh, hollow steel uh, tube sections coming into that, but then in other areas, those might need to be smaller. So then in conversations that we're having with the individuals that are looking at the cast nodes, uh, it's figuring out how can we actually take and go about designing these things, similar in a way to the Cleveland uh, facade panels where there are actually break points built into the shaping so that you could easily take and imagine pulling the actual pattern that the entire thing gets the molds made off of you could actually create these seam lines that are actually embedded within the aesthetic. So it's creating then less work in the end for someone to try to grind down all these pieces. 
So we're also looking at different ways that you could even consider making the mold. Perhaps it's not a giant block of something that you CNC machine and subtract a bunch of material to get the final product. Maybe we're actually able to take and make molds out of sheet goods and fold these things up uh, in a much shorter period of time. We're also taking and 3D printing all these pieces so that we can look at what it means to bring all these together. So that's all the 3D prints stacked in the printer, cleaning them all off, how they might come together. And this as a tool and the building of these models isn't just so that we have a presentation tool to share with other people. They become a communication tool to actually have the others that aren't always embedded within the model understanding to a greater degree what it is we're trying to do and getting buy off much more quickly than if we're just showing them, say, drawings. So I think, you know, for us what's, what's fascinating is really this evolution of research in these projects. Um, Make, making its way from really uh, specialized systems within projects and really bridging out to the rest of the project itself and, and becoming something that's much more substantial and really beginning to lead the entirety of a consultant team um, as well as the, as the client team. And we're, we're finding ourselves every day um, in, this, in this role of, of educating our, 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 our owners, educating our, our uh, consultants, our engineers um, in, in the, the results of our research and really using that uh, to, to drive not only just the formal and, and uh, 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 I guess I'd say the, uh, uh, the, the aesthetic approaches uh, or, or the constructability approaches, but really the, the whole, the entire ethos of the project and the organization and collaboration of the team is really driven from that as well. So uh, with that, I think uh, we're gonna wrap it up. Thank you. Thanks guys.